Hello, uh, my name is uh, Florian Pichenka. I am uh, the head of unit of science, research and education at the Austrian Permanent Representation. I'm here uh, to represent uh, the Austrian presidency and I want to welcome all of you uh, to this symposium. Um, starting with a big thank you to the organizers, uh, especially to Loch uh, from my side, but also to Swiss Corps. Um, yeah, um, I'm coming from the Ministry of Science, Research and Education, and actually um, I personally am dealing with the Education Committee. Um, you might know that uh, we had council on Monday and we reached a partial general agreement on the next Erasmus Plus program. Um, and myself, I was also dealing with uh, the Director General's meeting of higher education uh, this year. We had it in October in Vienna. And uh, there are two statements uh, that, I, that I took with me and that I want to, um, to share with you. Um, the first one, sorry, sometimes I need a paper. Um, the first one comes from the World Economic Forum and they identified the most important skills for the 21st century. It's complex problem solving, critical thinking and creativity. And um, we had a presentation of uh, Director Gerald Bast. He is a uh, rector of the University of Arts in Vienna. And he gave a very long speech about the future of education. Um, and he, he showed some statistics that I also want to share with you. Uh, because I think it's, it's uh, well connected to, to our uh, theme of this afternoon. Um, he said uh, 34,550 peer-reviewed scientific journals exist worldwide, 2.5 million scientific papers published per year, and every 20 seconds a scientific paper is being published. I find it quite interesting. Um, you might also know uh, or be aware that under the Austrian presidency, uh, just a few days ago, I think it was uh, this week or at the end of last week, uh, there was a big conference uh, taking place in Vienna about the European Open Science Cloud, um, which goes also in this direction uh, that will allow millions of researchers to store, share, uh, manage, analyze and reuse waste amounts of data and uh, that under the Horizon 2020 uh, program, nearly 600 million euros have been assigned uh, to this cloud. Um, and looking a bit into the future, um, also under the next program, Horizon Europe, which is being negotiated exactly at this moment, and actually um, uh, three quarter of my units, they are busy now with the minister who just arrived a half an hour ago because tomorrow we have the Compact Council and hopefully, crossing fingers, we will reach a partial general agreement on Horizon Europe, at least on one of the topics. Um, is also having a strong focus on open science and open access to publications and data. And this shall be the general rule for all projects uh, financed under Horizon Europe. So I hope uh, this is going to, be, to become uh, a reality. And in this sense, um, I'm not an expert in these issues, but I'm very much interested and looking forward uh, to this afternoon and uh, to, yeah, to the distinguished guests and uh, talks. And uh, yeah, and that's from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian, for those, uh, for those words opening this symposium. Welcome uh, from, from myself as well. My name is Lee Baker. I'm the director of the health team at Interrail European Affairs. Uh, our work at Interrail is um, mostly on the interface between scientific research and, and uh, innovation and policy. And this includes uh, the work that we do to help support open science advocacy in Europe with Frontiers. So it's a great pleasure for us to be involved in this event. Um, as you well know, the member states uh, committed to a transition to open access uh, by 2020, a full immediate open access by 2020. And the principles by which uh, that was then committed to, uh, to take place was through principles such as transparency, sustainability, uh, the viability of economic models, uh, and fair pricing, as well, of course, as research integrity, which should go without saying. 
So today, uh, the first topic, I'm very pleased to moderate this opening session of the symposium here. And the opening topic is, uh, do we have an opening slide? We're going to be discussing the transition to open access from the perspective of fostering transparent and competitive uh, sector in the digital era. That's the opening session today. For this, we've got a distinguished panel to, uh, to kick some of these ideas around. Um, we've got representatives from research funding organizations, uh, and, uh, of course, from universities, from economists, and also, of course, from open access publishers and platforms. So, first of all, without any further ado, uh, the way we'll work, we'll have a short opening remarks from each of the speakers, and then uh, we'll panel debate, and, of course, we'll, we'll open it up for, uh, to the floor as well for open discussion. So, first of all, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Camilla Markram. Camilla is a researcher at the EPFL in Lausanne and also the CEO and co-founder of Frontiers Open Science Platform. Camilla, may I ask you to come on stage and kick us off. Thank you very much, everybody, um, for being here. I'll stand maybe here and I'll click myself through this. Ah, perfect. Then I'll stand here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for everybody to attend uh, this session. It's my pleasure to, to give the first little six minutes. I hope I'll be able to run through this fast enough, so bear with me. So at Frontiers, we actually have a very simple mission, and that is to make science open. And in order to achieve that in a, in a responsible way, but as well in a quality-focused way, we believe it actually takes really three components. Uh, we need a transparent marketplace that actually fosters and allows uh, competition. We, the journals, the open science uh, publishers and platform, actually need to deliver scientific excellence and high-quality publications. That's our responsibility. But as well, what we require is from the universities and from the funders to as well move uh, away from the journal impact factors to evaluate researchers' careers to article and author-level metrics. So I'll, in the six minutes, we'll be able only to run for the first two, but we have a session on the, on the other one, on the evaluation and the changes in the evaluation ne system needed in order to achieve open science just after this session. So transparent marketplace, what does that mean? It's actually for decades that uh, researchers did not really know how much it costs to neither read nor publish in their favorite uh, journals. And it was really only with the advent of open access uh, journals and open access publishers that article processing charges were introduced. And that, for the very first time in history, made the prices transparent and the costs associated with some very basic services, such as peer-reviewing articles, uh, publishing them, and disseminating them. And now you're actually able, anybody in the world is able to compare these prices to each other. It was not possible with art transparency before. So you can now compare prices of gold open access publishers to prices of uh, hybrid uh, open access publishers, and so forth. And what you actually find is that these are far more cost-effective than the traditional subscription system. So this is a study, but there's many, that, but this particular one was commissioned by the EU and came out, I believe, last year, and it estimates that an uh, average subscription article costs around four to 5,000 euros to produce and publish. An average uh, open access article, on the other hand, costs around 1,500 euros if it's in, in, in gold or around 2,500 euros on average if it is in a hybrid journal. What you see from that is that the costs are actually much lower in the open science uh, system. But you can also put it into, in a different way. This shows you the article and the revenue shares that are being uh, generated. So open access publishers have actually managed in the last few years to grab around 15 or 17 till 21 percent of the yearly article share, whereas uh, they're capturing only 5 to 7 percent of the revenue share. Again, this just shows you that it's more cost efficient to publish open access. 
And the reality is that universities and funders could in fact save at least 5 billion euros, if not more, if they were to transition or if we were in a completely open access world. And that's money that, rather than spending it on publishing, could be reinvested into more research. The other thing that we need in order to generate this transparent uh, marketplace that fosters competition is to actually have to ban, and this is a responsibility, I believe, from uh, both policymakers, universities, but as well funders, to ban these non-disclosure agreements between universities and subscription publishers. It is already today possible to do these types of agreements, it's just a matter of will, I guess, to do these agreements in a completely transparent way. Frontiers, for example, has uh, signed two such first-of-its-kind agreements this year with Austria and the Austrian fund, Science Fund, and with Sweden as well, that facilitates the payments between us our open science platform and uh, the universities in these countries. Anybody in the world can download this agreement, they're completely transparent. Uh, you, can, you can read every single clause in it and that is actually the way of how to keep the checks and balances on pricing, uh, pricing and costs uh, in publishing through complete transparency. Anybody can use this type of information in any other deal. And it's as well a way how to stimulate and foster competition amongst publishers on the pricing. So it can be done more cost efficient. The other thing is, uh, can it deliver quality? We, as, as the publishers or the platforms, actually have the responsibility to certify the research and make sure that it is of the highest quality. So we have to deliver scientific excellence at scale. Um, there are, however, all these confusions out there. There are the voices that say, well, the open access publishers, oh, they're new, they're incentivized to just make money, they'll accept any type of article, basically, just to make this other 1,500 euros. I say we got to look at the data, and when you do look at the data, you'll find that open access works extremely well. So what we have done is actually taken the database uh, of St. Margaret's based on Elsevier's Scopus database, and we've analyzed, uh, and you can download this data as well, it's in this non-visible link down there, but the presentation is as well available. So you can um, sort now, we've taken the 20 largest publishers uh, last year, and we sorted them by their average citation rate to articles published within the last three years, so very recent data. And when you do that, you'll find that amongst these publishers, pure open access publishers are ac actually coming out really well on the average citation rates. You'll find, for example, that Frontiers today is the fourth most cited publisher. Um, above us, you'll have only uh, society publishers in very specialized areas, such as uh, the American Chemical Society and the Royal Society for Chemistry or Amer American Physical Society, so these are areas with high citation counts. But you also see that we are not alone there. There is PLOS, they are the sixth most cited publisher uh, on average, and there is MDPI, the eighth most cited publisher on average. And you'll find that both PLOS and, uh, PLOS and MDPI are at the very same level as Elsevier, and all of us are actually doing better than Wiley, Springer Nature, BMJ, IEEE, and so forth. That's the reality of today. But you can also um, look uh, within the publishers and what you'll find in there that their open access journals are always performing better than their subscription journals. So here again, the 20 largest publishers. In gray, you're seeing the, um, their subscription journals and in yellow, you're seeing their open access journals. So in the American Physical Society, their open access journals are performing better on her citations, same as the case for Oxford University Press. Springer Nature's open access journals generate twice as many citations nearly as their subscription journals at the same level as Frontiers. And yes, over here you'll find Elsevier and indeed their subscription journals are still doing better than their open access journals, but only just as well as the PLOS journals and not as well as the open access journals of Springer Nature or Frontiers. 
So that is across publishers. You can do the same picture emerges if you start looking at the subject-specific category. So here we are now in the journal citation report, the latest one, and you'll find that uh, the top most cited journals today in neuroscience, in microbiology, in plant science, psychology, and so forth are frontiers journals, pure open, uh, open access journals. And the same picture emerges in the multidisciplinary category where you have your very famous brand journals, Nature, Science. You'll <coughs> probably be surprised to learn that they are not the top most cited today. They are actually the three most cited journals today are purely open access journals. And together, they're generating twice, twice as many citations as Nature, Science, and PNAS combined. So our open access today, this is all based on the latest data. You can download the files and everything and make your own calculations, but open access today is delivering greater impact than subscription journals. And I think it is quite safe to say today that open access in this scenario delivers better value at a better price. So I hope that was in within the six minutes run through through the, um, uh, through the yeah. Approximately. Approximately. <laughs> okay. Good. Because I had a okay. few more slides, but uh, <coughs> thank you very much. I'll leave that to another time. Thank you, Camilla. Wonderful. Our next speaker is is going to give us the perspective from from an economist, uh, and Alexis Valkius is the visiting professor in microeconomics at the University Libre here in Brussels, and he's also the chief economist of the Belgian Competition Authority. Alexis, welcome. Thank you. Uh, good to know that I can talk approximately six minutes, <laughs> um, <laughs> because that's new, the new benchmark, no? Um, thanks a lot for minutes? having me. Uh, this uh, <laughs> brings me back uh, to a very different uh, uh, period of my life, uh, because indeed, as Lee said, uh, you know, I now moved uh, to the competition authority, but uh, back in the days, uh, I did a PhD on uh, the economics uh, of science, uh, science uh, well, the economic story of science and higher education, and we had this paper and this report uh, that uh, uh, was published uh, back in the days. So um, uh, it is important to know that you know I don't speak in my capacity, my new capacity. Basically, this has nothing to do my, with my current job. I basically, uh, you know, represent a group of people who have done some research a couple of years ago, and I will try to argue that what we said at the time is still uh, useful now. So this is our report uh, back in 2006. Uh, the first bullet points uh, tell you how hard it was you know, to get to the data. That's not exactly what you want to look at. Uh, what you want to know is that uh, prices of journals, uh, for-profit journals, uh, were at the time uh, much, uh, much higher than not-for-profit journals. And basically, you know, it was interesting for us because we are economists, and uh, uh, when, when I say much higher, it's in the order of magnitude or, uh, of three or uh, two, four times higher. Which means basically, if you try and sell, you know, a car uh, at <coughs> three times the price uh, because you are for profit and you have competitors who are not for profit, uh, and people still buy your car, uh, you would be really amazed. That's what happens in scientific publishing. And so that was very important for us. Uh, I want to highlight uh, two points I will come back to. Uh, first of all, uh, there were significant differences across disciplines, and I think you know that this cross-discipline uh, difference is something I want to come back to later. And uh, lastly, uh, I want also to uh, come back on the fact that uh, for-profit publishers did accompany the growth of research much more than scientific societies, which basically were, you know, uh, com uh, concentrating on top research, and that basically what uh, is important for what I will say uh, within a couple of minutes. Now, we are many years later, uh, things have not changed, you know, prices have uh, continued increasing, uh, revenues per article are still very high, 
And uh, I have uh, looked at you know, the profit margins. Uh, you know, if you want to see that uh, Apple and uh, Google are cheap uh, companies, just look at the revenues or the margins of uh, some of these publishers. Well, uh, still, you know, Hermès is still uh, more expensive, but I think that all of us would agree that Hermès is uh, uh, expensive, and you, you, you knew about it before I told. Anyways, uh, let me skip that slide uh, because I guess that you know you, you know about it. Uh, now let's turn maybe to the causes. Uh, the first important aspect is this idea of uh, multi-sided uh, markets. Uh, multi-sided markets were developed by uh, Jean Tirole, who is now a, a Nobel Prize in economics uh, for that. Um, and uh, basically, what he uh, said is, you know, in a number of markets what you try to do is uh, to connect different types of users. And uh, his example was uh, the example of credit cards. And uh, what he said is, you know, you don't want to have a credit card, basically, if you can't use it in a shop. Similarly, uh, you don't want, as a shop, to ac accept a credit card unless a number of people will uh, use that credit card. And so basically these platforms, these multi-sided platforms, serve different types of individuals. And that's uh, crucial uh, here, because uh, basically uh, the uh, scientific publishers serve at the same time authors and readers. Uh, eventually you can add you know, uh, universities more broadly with the metrics, etc. But uh, it is important to understand that authors in particular are very well served uh, by uh, uh, for-profit publishers uh, uh, and other publishers. And so the point <coughs> is, uh, uh, you know, there are many other platforms. Uh, uh, Facebook is a platform. Uh, they serve both you who want to uh, connect with friends as well as uh, uh, advertisers. But the whole point is that if one of uh, the communities is well served, it is very difficult to have the other uh, community moving. And that is essentially in what I will uh, uh, say, because uh, the point is that uh, certification is crucial. Uh, I think that we all agree that you know uh, uh, articles that are published uh, in good journals tend to be uh, good articles, and there is a lot of research uh, done on that, and uh, 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 readers know that as well. So readers basically want to read the good research that is certified. So basically authors want to uh, have certified research, their research certified, and uh, readers want to go to the best. Um, then uh, another thing is, I told you already, not-for-profit publishers focused mainly on uh, top research and were less interested by uh, less top research. And uh, uh, this is an important dynamic, you know, basically uh, for-profit publishers ended up certifying research of people who could not uh, uh, access, you know, the top journals. Um, it's an intermediate market. Uh, you know that libraries pay, uh, readers do not. Basically, then they are less price sensitive. And there is a lot of uh, lack of transparency. No one knows exactly what the others pay. And we know uh, that everyone <coughs> pays a different price. This is uh, you know, related to uh, what is on the next uh, slide. Bundling uh, plays an important role. And uh, this is also an important point, basically, uh, what uh, you do when you bundle is that uh, you put together things that are essential and things that are less essential. And we know that in some disciplines, uh, the journals of uh, the big uh, for-profit publishers are essential. What they do is that they bundle them together with other uh, uh, journals, and basically you end up uh, buying many things. And so uh, in economic terms, we say that you can leverage market power from one uh, uh, discipline or from one uh, market to the other. And so this is an important point. This bundling uh, is an important po point. And uh, um, this... Uh, uh, links to what has been called double dipping, which is this idea that, you know, uh, even if some uh, articles are uh, available open access, basically libraries end up paying for it uh, within the bundle. Now, what's the way forward? Uh, well, uh, you know, foster competition would be nice. Uh, uh, how do you do that? That's much more complex. 
uh, from new entrants, uh, that's uh, nice as well. How do you do that? Uh, again, uh, you know, uh, Camilla had uh, told you a story of a, of a successful entrant. I guess that this helps. Uh, but uh, there is all the question about this bundling. And you know how to unbundle uh, uh, articles, how to unbundle journals first, and then unbundle articles eventually. And so uh, this is, you know, uh, I guess one of the questions that uh, policymakers want to address. Now, uh, uh, what about uh, Plan S? Uh, well, um, on the one hand, you know, you want uh, to believe that uh, you know it will help solve uh, the problems. Uh, how uh, would it would that be the case? Well, if a, a sufficient number of people move uh, to open access, but at the same time uh, it's riskful. Why? Because uh, we need certification. Uh, basically, you know, uh, if authors have basically this arbitrage between uh, you know uh, being funded and uh, doing research that is certified by the best uh, journals, uh, there uh, there might be a problem. And so, uh, basically, coming back to you know my two-sided market stuff, uh, you uh, m must make sure that everyone is on board, including uh, these authors who uh, are currently uh, well served. Now, um, uh, so finally, uh, you know, two two uh, maybe uh, final words. First of all, uh, I think that you know many of the initiatives until now have been quite cross, across the board. I think that you know not uh, enough attention has been uh, uh, dedicated to understand better how the disciplines differ. Uh, it is clear that for me, as an economist, uh, I found out uh, lately that you know uh, my access to the university account. Uh, was not secured anymore uh, for, for whatever reason, you know, uh, because I accessed it from remotely and uh, there was a conflict with uh, uh, my, uh, what I could do from, uh, the, from my office at the ministry. But so basically, uh, I can find most of the articles uh, without big problems. Why? Because these articles are mostly there in the forms of working papers and that most of what I'm looking for is still accessible. Uh, I understand that this would not be the case if I was not an economist. And so, you know, in some disciplines, uh, uh, access to uh, uh, research means access through uh, an article. <coughs> and so it's very important to understand these different, different disciplines because basically uh, acting on the disciplines where the problems are most important is uh, <coughs> crucial. Finally, uh, one must understand what uh, works well currently, and again, I think that certifying works well, and this is, you know, you need to have all uh, people on board, but I won't repeat again uh, what I said already. I hope that this was more like in the six minutes. <laughs> very approximately. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Alexis. I'm playing the bad guy role here of timekeeper. Next, next up, we, we're going to hear from the, the university sector. I'm pleased to welcome Michael, uh, Professor Michael Hengartner, who is not only the president of the University of Zurich, but also of Swiss universities, the, uh, the organization of Swiss universities. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I decided to invest my six minutes in telling you briefly about the national open access strategy of Switzerland. So in 2015, the Ministry of Education and Research basically told the university sector, we need national open access strategy. Uh, typically Swiss, rather than having just a ministerial directive, we had a letter and then we could bottom up decide to develop this vision by ourselves. After about a year of work, uh, what we ended up with is a paper, about four pages, where we basically committed to uh, publish all scholarly articles that are funded by uh, open money, by uh, public money, open access by the end of 2024. Uh, publications by private money are encouraged but not forced. Now I realize this is not a very ambitious goal, first on the timeline, 2024, if you compare to other countries, other initiatives, is fairly leisurely. And the second one is uh, not all scientific papers published in Switzerland should be open access, but only the ones that are uh, supported by uh, taxpayers' money. Uh, the reason for that was that during this year, uh, we realized that actually going in this route 
um, was a quite heterogeneous enterprise. So the reasons people wanted to open access were actually quite distinct, depending on who you talk to. And there were basically three emotions that were uh, vibrating together uh, in, in the going to this goal. The first was a, a feeling by many scientists that science that had been funded by the public should be accessible, accessible to the public. So uh, it's a public good, it was financed, it should be access to everybody, and therefore it should be published open access. And that explains why um, research done by private money, foundations, companies, we decided, well, it's not open access necessarily, it would be nice, but we can't force it because it's not taxpayers' money. The second thing was uh, emotion was an increasing frustration with the big publishers, for profit publishers, uh, scientists feeling that they were getting gouged basically by these uh, very high uh, margins we just heard about from uh, the, our professor of economics, um, and, and the feeling that this was not right. So again here, taxpayers' money was invested into profits for private company rather than being invested into uh, research and education. And because of that, we decided that well, what we needed is to have cost transparency and cost neutrality in the coming. Uh, now, uh, Camille offered us uh, great savings or promised us great saving in this move to open access. There's some skepticism in other parts of the country regarding that, but at least we said we don't want to pay more just because we want to open access than we had before. Um, the third feeling uh, was a feeling that basically there, there was a stranglehold on, uh, on publications by these big publishers, and that in fact uh, it, it, the whole system was maybe broke because uh, were we really recruiting and promoting the best scientists or were we simply promoting and recruiting the most productive scientists, productive being defined as number of publications in a defined set of journals uh, which were ranked based on how many citations they have. And that uh, led us to, to feel that we needed a more diverse scientific publication landscape, or also new forms of publication. Why should it have the form of a paper? It's not a paper anymore, right? It's a bunch of electrons. There might be more interesting ways of publishing your science. And, and more generally, and perhaps more ambitious, uh, most ambitiously, um, a revision of how scientists are evaluated and promoted, away from this purely quantitative to looking back into content and quality of the science that we do. All right, so based on this strategy, we then developed an, an action plan where concrete steps are, are being proposed. Uh, this document has also been uh, looked at, uh, basically uh, sent into consultation with the Swiss universities, and the university landscape has approved it. And we have basically seven or eight uh, action areas, if you want, or, or, or areas of activity where we would like to move forward. Uh, the first is developing common policies. Switzerland is very heterogeneous where it is in the open access landscape. Most of the universities already have policies. Many of the universities of, op of applied sciences do not. Here we'd like to go, come to a common understanding. What do we actually want to achieve? Uh, second, we decided a big uh, step gain would be done uh, by moving to a read and publish strategy where just like Germany, we start saying, look, publishers, we're perfectly happy to pay for publishing. You do a valuable service. Uh, quality control, we just heard about it. This is worth something, you, you format it, you distribute it, that's all worth something. We pay for that, we don't pay for reading. The, you know, the fringe costs of sending those extra electrons when I download a paper are basically zero. I don't want to pay for reading anymore, and I don't want anybody else to pay for reading anymore. I want my papers to be freely accessible, generally, uh, but we will pay a fair amount for you to do the quality control, the processing that you do quite well. Um, Online resources, um, for Green Road, do we need repositories? How many repositories do we need? Or should they be university-based, uh, area-based? Um, do we need one? Do we need many? Also, where are we going to put the data? So open access is just the first step in, into open science, and then the discussions become open data repository, data lifecycle management. Mm -hmm. So here, online resources needs and, and then proposal for implementation. Um, and then, again, support for alternative form of publishing. We can imagine new forms of publishing, uh, but also perhaps simply uh, financial support for the cost of journals flipping from going from a subscription mode to an open access mode that would help us then also reach our goals. Communication, we're absolutely convinced, and we heard that, that the system can only move forward if the community accepts it. Uh, we have a system that currently works. It's suboptimal, but it works. Uh, any change is difficult. So how do we get the community to come along? I think we need a strong uh, communication initiative where we uh, keep talking to the people, talk with the people, and make sure that their fears are, are heard or addressed. 
so that we have this as a, as a common initiative and not as some, some management decision. Reform of the research evaluation process, I think the most ambitious, the most long-term goal, uh, there's no way we'll reach that by 2024. It, it basically, we need to change the way we think we identify the best people. Uh, and that is a huge challenge. And I'm not even sure a small country like Switzerland can do that on its own. Because as long as the rest of the world has other criteria, other priorities, uh, we're not an island. Well, we're not Great Britain. We're, we're in the middle of Europe, it turns out. I've been there for 60 million years, my geologist friend told me, and apparently we'll stay there for a little while longer uh, if uh, the tectonic plates move the way they should. Supportive legislative environment, we'd like to have a, a, a secondary publication right in the, in the Swiss law. Um, text and data mining is important, of course, again, if we go into open science. Uh, open data, and monitoring, we don't have a very efficient way of actually knowing where we are. So we did a one-time analysis 2015, we're 30% open access, which is not bad, but we need to have, we have an efficient way of monitoring how we're making progress towards this goal of 100% by 2024. My last slide, so this is our, our time plan, we're at the beginning of the implementation phase, so we mostly have set up the groups. Uh, the analysis of the people doing this. In the coming next year, we'll focus mostly on access policies, on negotiations with publisher, on setting up communication and monitoring tools so that we can get people together and we can follow where we are. And the real hard stuff will actually happen 2021 to 24, infrastructures, resources, new forms of publishing, research evaluation. I need to finish by saying that we took also a typical Swiss approach in the sense that we're extremely flexible in how we're going to reach this goal. Uh, Switzerland, again, is a very decentral country. The cantons have a lot of uh, authority. The university system is actually also decentralized, and we have different types of universities. So what we said is, get to 100% open access. I don't care how you get there. Get their gold, get their gold, uh, green, get their hybrid, get their platinum, a, a collection of this within the university. I don't care. Just make it accessible, make it available. Uh, so we try to respect the autonomy of the higher education system um, while nevertheless getting some coordination. And I think the coordination will be part of the biggest challenge because we're at different steps in the process, because people are, have different drivers, different scientific cultures or humani humanities people are a completely different place from the economics or the physicists and so forth. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the advantage of this is that, of course, it gives us a huge flexibility so that we can see what happens in the rest of the world and we can take up initiatives from outside that might be beneficial to the system, uh, Plan S being one example, but definitely not the last one. And with this, I close, uh, and I hope I wasn't... No, I was actually probably the best one so far. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think Michael has issued a challenge to our next speakers. Um, so our next speaker, we're now going to move to the funder sector, the sector of research funders. And first of all, I'm very pleased to introduce Falk Reckling. Falk is the head of department for strategy uh, at the Austrian Science Fund, strategy with respect to open science policy, uh, including open science policy. Over to you, Falk. Thanks very much. <clears throat> I would like to use the event here to reflect a little bit for a broader perspective. I would like briefly to outline here um, the relationship between funders and publishers. And when I use the term funders, then I mean always both the research performing organizations, universities, etc., and the research funding organizations. In the Current discussion about Plan S seems to me goes back to an unclarified uh, yeah, relation between publishers and funders. Uh, from the funders' point of view, in recent years, one had the impression that the relationship between publishers and funders is somewhat broken. Um, and you can see here there are allegations that are well known. I, I'm not claiming that all the allegations are correct and valid and uh, concern all publishers, but at least some of them are valid to at least some publishers. And otherwise, one could not explain why we have so many declarations in the last couple of years, starting with uh, the tester declarations and now with Plan S or the, uh, the compliant by the uh, European University Association against uh, market behavior by publishers. And that is the reason why I try now to redefine a uh, the relation a little bit from, from a normative point of view. That means how should it actually be? 
and I use for that the preamble of Plan S, written by Mark Schultz, and a really interesting con contribution of a Swedish bioengineer, Matthias Bjornmalm, some month ago. And it begins by following the redefinition. The function of a publisher is not to own research results and then to distribute them, but to provide services <coughs> that facilitates the navigation, understanding, and applications of research results in a transparent way. From this starting point, I would like to develop this further and briefly propose three core principles and six operational principles for the relationship between funders and publishers. The first one is the task of publishers and funders is to fulfill the normative essence of science and scholarship. That means making research more open, transparent, and comprehensible. The second point is that the public and the scientific community has a legitimate right to be supplied with open products and adequate services at <coughs> transparent costs and conditions. At the same, also publishers have uh, a legitimate right to receive an adequate compensation. And I should add to this, that also includes reasonable <coughs> profits. After all, we live still in a capitalist economic system, but reasonable prices or profits can only be merged if there is a competition between different suppliers. Six operational principles. Researchers can publish open access in all academic venues without deep delay. Quality control. All publication venues follow strict rules of transparency and integrity and have to be registered in databases with transparent quality control. Copyright authors hold the copyright of their publication, not publishers, with no restrictions. All publication must be published under an open license that allow a maximum reuse of research results. Reproducibility, an important topic. Whenever legally and ethically possible, all data and similar materials underlying research results have to be openly deposited in a repository applying the standards of trusted entities. Content mining, all data related to publications must be freely available via open standards, um, making unrestricted data and text mining possible. And the last one is open contracts, all agreements on products of scholarly communication between publishers and funders, including costs, terms, and conditions and services have to be openly accessible. Despite the various interests of funders and publishers, and they are sometimes obvious, I'm optimistic that can be, there can be a productive relationship between uh, performing organizations, uh, funding organizations, and publishers. The precondition for that would be, or can be summed up in two words, more openness. And Plan S, which will be presented by Stefan Kuster very soon, shows how this looks like in concrete terms, or the how should could like in concrete terms. So, I think five minutes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Falk. I think you won. I, I think Falk is the front runner. So, uh, our last speaker before we, 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 uh, we, we debate some of these issues is Stefan Kuster. Stefan is the Secretary General of Science Europe, the European Association of Research Funding Organizations. Stefan, over to you. Good afternoon. Um, that's going to be hard to beat. Uh, I think that was less than four minutes. Uh, I'm going to cheat, though. I'm trying to be second, so I, I have a little alarm here. Ah. Uh, right. Okay, so um, if you're interested in open science and don't live on another planet, then 
chances are you've heard of Plan S, and if you've been paying attention today, you've heard it at least mentioned three times. I think every presentation so far has mentioned Plan S. So um, it's about time that I tell you, or someone tells you what Plan S is. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Coalition S, who, that's the group of funders behind Plan S that develop Plan S and that are committed to implement, implementing it. What, what do they want? What is the, the aim of, uh, of this group of funders? Well, first, it is to finally uh, accomplish uh, the objective of the open access movement, which is by now about 30 years old and, uh, as we've heard previously, has not delivered, has not uh, achieved the results that were set up to achieve in the many uh, declarations that Falk uh, listed in, in, in his first slide. So it's full and immediate open access to publications resulting from publicly funded research. This obviously also requires, and that's another aim of the coalition, a shift towards new models of academic publishing. Uh, and let me be a bit more explicit here. There is no reason today, whether technological or economical or other, um, to put knowledge and results of, of research behind paywalls. Be this subscription-based paywalls, or be these excessive prices uh, uh, and publication fees in, in open access models. Um, so that is a clear, even though here it's not very explicit, but new publication models that don't put up and don't hide uh, knowledge behind, behind paywalls. Um, the coalition also aims for a system of scholarly publishing that is more transparent, efficient and fair with uh, a reasonable pricing and open pricing structures, uh, open contracts. We saw the example mentioned before of the Austrian uh, frontiers. Uh, Camilla, you showed the example of, of, the, of the contract with Austria and, uh, and, and Sweden. These contracts are open, available uh, on the net. The information is there. This is the kind of transparency that uh, Plan S and Coalition S aims for. Also a culture, a new scientific culture that ensures that uh, all scholars, but also uh, vulnerable communities like early career researchers, uh, uh, um, uh, researchers in, in less uh, well-off science systems, can publish and can have their uh, results uh, accessible. Um, and this starts and goes through what Michael mentioned, uh, reforming the evaluation system in science. Um, we cannot tell authors that they are no longer allowed to publish in certain journals, but then we use those journals to see how many publications does this person have, and uh, therefore is she or he uh, a good or a bad scientist. That has to stop as well, and Coalition S, uh, this is one of the aims, and the plan is creates strong incentives to change that as well, and there is actually a, committing, a commitment by the funders to uh, change that, starting with signing DORA. Signing a declaration doesn't change the system per se, but it's a, it's, it's a first step, and it shows a public commitment to do that. So far, so good, but so far, not so new. I mean, these are essentially the same aims that the, 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 um, the statements that Falk mentioned and the different uh, um, uh, initiatives already had. What is new, though, is this collective action by funders. Funders are a relatively blunt actor. They have one tool, and that is money, <laughs> but they can attach conditions that they, to, that, to that money, and with that comes a certain power. Obviously, there's also a certain responsibility. Um, there's a debate uh, around academic freedom uh, attached to uh, uh, what conditions a funder can attach to its funding. Um, but this is uh, uh, what funders can do, uh, is uh, as stewards of public funding for research, attach some minimal conditions, paying very careful attention that it doesn't impinge on academic freedom, and by moving collectively, and that is what is new in coalition, is that a group of funders mo is moving collectively and implementing these policies. That's what is, let's say, the to use a buzzword, the game-changing nature of, of Coalition S. Um, the group started with 11 funders two months ago when it was announced. By now it has grown to 16, uh, including some very large non-public funders, charity funders like the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation, and it's also supported by the European Commission and the European Research Council, and I have to say that support is more than just moral support. The Commission and the European Research Council are part of the implementation uh, and are working on ways of implementing the principles and, and, and details of Plan S in the next uh, framework program. And, uh, uh, so, so, so that support is a commitment uh, to, to work in Coalition S. Very briefly, a bit of detail. The main aim is that as of 1st of January 2020, publications arising from funding of these funders will have to be uh, um, published either on open access platforms, open access journals, um, immediate... Oh, that's my alarm. I have one minute left. Right. <laughs> um, 
10 principles behind this main aim. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I mentioned a few very important ones. First, copyright retention by the author or the institution. That's a very uh, important principle. That empowers the author. That gives the power to the author uh, uh, of what is going to happen with her or his publication. Coupled with that is uh, the obligation to uh, attach a CC BY license to the publication. Um, second important um, principle is that um, uh, hybrid is no longer uh, considered compliant, so publishing in so-called hybrid journals, the hybrid journal is not considered compliant. Um, funders commit to uh, supporting the necessary infrastructure for this in fields where no open access or compliant open access outlets exist to create incentives to support uh, their creation and also to support the infrastructure that underlies here, uh, uh, such as uh, repositories, um, uh, directories, uh, and so on, that are going to be under heavy pressure from such a plan to support those infrastructures. Very much in practice, what does it mean? How can a journal or a, a publication venue be compliant with open access, uh, with Plan S? There's three ways. One is by being an open access journal or an open access platform, not just uh, any, under any conditions, but with some very strict conditions, starting by the, the ones I already mentioned. Uh, full and immediate uh, open access by, the, by attaching a CC BY license. Um, no embargoes. Um, uh, and uh, being listed in the OAJ, uh, there is actually going to be, in, in, in sometime in the future, a Plan S seal uh, attached to journals and, and, uh, and platforms listed in the OAJ uh, that comply with Plan S requirements. The second way is um, by depositing your article in an open access repository without embargo, preferably the version of record, but at the very least, the author's accepted manu uh, manuscript. Uh, and third is, um, I mentioned before, hybrid journals are not compliant. There is only a very small exception to that. That is hybrid journals that are clearly part of a transformative process and where a transformative agreement, and one of the conditions for such an agreement is that it's open and uh, transparent. Journals that offer that kind of transformative agreement <coughs> That kind of hybrid is tolerated, I would say, in, in Plan S for a short period of time. Uh, we are talking about uh, three years. Um, there's going to be a revision of the principles and the, 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 uh, the implementation guidelines of Plan S in three years, and that is probably going to fall off. So hybrid is only accepted under that very small exception for a very limited period of time. Right, there has been a lot of debate uh, around Plan S. We have received a lot of input. A lot of that input has gone into the, the, the development of the implementation details. The details are public since last Tuesday, and there is now a consultation process, a, a feedback process open until end of February, so anyone can go to the, the new website, which I failed to list here because it's so new that it didn't exist when I prepared the slides. It's coalition slash S, no, no, not slash, dash S, coalition, das.s.org, you will find the implementation guidelines, the principles, and also a feedback form to provide us with feedback until the end of February. That feedback will help to, if necessary, further adapt the plan. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, the plan is going into, place, uh, into play on the 1st of January 2020. I think uh, Falcon Michael beat me with the time, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. Okay, so may I ask all of the speakers to uh, take a seat, please? I will take one at the far end out of the way. Ah, there we go. Yes, that's fine. Just before I throw, uh, throw the, the debate open, I just have one burning question that, um, in the spirit of cross-fertilization, my own um, field um, and, and background is in health, as I mentioned before, and in health advocacy, there's often sometimes a phrase used in civil society of uh, nobody left behind. 
um, in the sense of making sure every population group can uh, benefit from a technology or a change in policy. And I, I wonder in if a spirit in cross-fertilization, the same principle applies here. So just before I open, how do we make sure that open access and, and particularly a transparent competitive sector is available to all, all first of all, all academic fields, and secondly, uh, that everybody within those fields has affordable options to do so, to make sure that, that nobody's excluded from this process. Alexis, you mentioned the cross-disciplinarity aspect at the top, and you wanted to return to that, and you mentioned. So how does that need to be done, and do provisions that are currently in place, for example, with the Swiss plan, with Plan S, do they address those concerns? Uh, well, I'm afraid I will not. Uh, I, uh, sorry, um, I'm afraid I won't be able to tell you how it can be done. Uh, but I think it's very important that it is being done, and that you know uh, the different uh, cultures <coughs> of publishing are taken into account uh, when uh, making a plan for. Uh, all disciplines together. And that's, I think, one of the keys of the success, is to be able to address the problems of all disciplines. And as I uh, explained earlier, I think that you know bundling is attractive uh, to publishers because they have such a market power uh, in some disciplines. Mm -hmm. And uh, this market power derives from a culture of publication in these disciplines. And so it's important to identify first in which disciplines this is the case and to address uh, the problems of these disciplines in particular first. Mm. May I ask from the funding point of view uh, and also the university's point of view, uh, anything you'd like to add there with respect to provisions? Are the provisions um, so far in place designed specifically to take that into account, that cross-disciplinarity? Stefan, for example. Well, you will find one specific mention of a field in, in the Plan S documents, only one, and that is to the social sciences and humanities. Um, uh, because, and in particularly in the humanities, um, the role that monographs and books and books chapters play, um, the first rollout of Plan S applies to articles. Um, uh, that gives the funders time to work with the communities, particularly humanities communities, there may be others that have some legitimate uh, special needs, some are path dependent and uh, are also part of a cultural shift. Um, so I, I would say that's, that's one field specific element. Otherwise the plan applies and the funders behind the plan fund all fields and the plan therefore applies to all fields. Okay. Maybe, maybe yeah. I can um, mention how we are solving it uh, at Frontiers because we're obviously as well confronted uh, with this challenge. So when, when we set out to, to start Frontiers, we started in the neuroscience community that was about 10 years ago, we're researchers ourselves. Um, and back then, 10 years ago, there also wasn't that much money. And today we are encounter encountering that there's also not that much money actually in the social sciences or in the humanities, some other fields, even though, you know, like it's slowly starting, the mentality is starting to change. But being confronted with that problem, this is basically how, how we solved it. How can we bring all these different communities and make them benefit from open science and be able to share it openly? So what we do is actually we have higher prices in communities that are richer. Those are traditionally in the, in the life sciences or maybe in the engineering communities. And we make it very clear to them that um, they're supporting countries, areas. It can be you know, like Latin America, the Eastern European uh, countries, but as well disciplines that just do not have as much research funding available. So higher APCs in certain disciplines, for us it's in microbiology, it's in neuroscience, traditionally richer disciplines, are actually supporting disciplines and as well researchers from communities or places with less research funding. And again, it's all about transparency and openness in communication. When we explain this to our editorial boards, and we have now 85,000 editors from all over the world on our editorial boards. And we tell them your APCs in, in, in this field are covering as well the publication costs of this discipline. They usually are okay with that. 
I think, you know, it's it's a democratic system in a way, and, and we living in Europe are actually as well subsidizing many other areas uh, across the world, and that's that's how it can be done. Falk, Michael, anything to add on this point? No, you can I think what we have done in Austria and also in Switzerland, we offer uh, funding programs for monographs, for example, as the Swiss National Science Fund and the Austrian Science Fund is doing that since years and I think that is, the, that is a, a proper model also to uh, shift that in the social sciences and humanities. Mm. And that is not new for us. You have to, especially in co continental Europe, uh, paying printing costs in the humanities and social sciences was uh, very usual since decades. So it is not actually a new model, it is a different model for a different format, but not a new business model. And presumably there's a role for waivers and, 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 and such like as well to ensure that um, it, 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 as well as different fields, you also have different resource settings can also... Yeah, we, are, we have about 6% of our articles are waived. Right. So if, if there are no questions asked, if somebody says they cannot afford, and believe me or not, it happens as well at Harvard, uh, just as it happens in Latin America or Africa or in Asia, um, we just waive it. And the same, the provision so forth in Plan S as well, Stefan, I believe. Plan S foresees uh, uh, waiver policies from the yep. publishers, yes. Okay. I, I wonder if for now we, sh we should open, open the debate to the floor. We're running a little bit later than we might have done. So um, I'd love to take some questions for the panel from the floor, please. Anybody would like to ask anything of our panel based on what we've heard so far? Yes, please. So may, I, may I ask you to say your name and where you're from, please, your affiliation? Uh, microphone is on its way. Uh, my, name is, my name is Kita. I uh, work for the French Scientific Research here in Brussels. I switch uh, is um, a fan, uh, funding agency. And I have a question for uh, Falk. Um, so he, he explained to us the way to um, establish a new uh, relationship with publishers. And um, I wonder if um, he thought about uh, a new way of doing that is probably to move the center of power because right now we are uh, in um, a kind of uh, landscape where uh, we have two fighters one a uh, light fighter and a uh, heavy uh, fighter. But if you take the chance to give researchers um, uh, publishing platforms, for example, you move the center of power and you can talk now with the publishers. What do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, we invest a lot of money, a lot of funding agencies invest a lot of money in new publication models. Uh, I won't name here any of them, but they are well known. Uh, I think that is one thing. Uh, and the other thing is to what uh, Alexis has shown, learn societies. I think it's very important to approach learn societies and to help them to flip their renowned journals to open access journals. And we know that it's an economic problem for them because uh, from the revenues of the subscription journals, they pay a lot of valuable things like grants, scholarships, etc. But in the end, the money for that comes from the same pocket, from the research institutions. So we need other mechanisms to fund learned societies that they are not dependent on uh, high revenues from subscription journals. And then we would have a totally different situation because then researchers can choose. They can go to the uh, renowned uh, Learn Society journals and publish open access there. Thank you. Yes, sir, please. Hi there, my name is Nick Brunsveld from the University of Amsterdam. Um, I have a question about Plan S. And, and actually, it, it continues on your question on how to involve uh, the research community in uh, how we go forward in open access uh, publishing. The way Plan S came about was a sort of a black box to researchers, to policy makers. Um, if you weren't part of NWO in the Netherlands, or even 
uh, you know, you, you had no idea what was going to be launched uh, a few months ago, and you had no idea what was going to be launched a few days ago. Um, so if you're asking about how can you involve the research community, well, perhaps involve the research community in setting up these plans. And one way you can do that quite easily, I think, is as NW in the Netherlands could do, and Swisscore, I suppose, in, in Switzerland, or, is by asking their researchers to, to look at those plans and to, to tell the, 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 the drafters of the plans what it would mean for their field if this were to be implemented. And then you could have expected the changes that have now been made uh, on beforehand already, um, because it's, it's been, um, we understand uh, that this is a very important to get the, the to, to escape the lock-in that we have with the, the publishers. But it's, to the researchers, it really feels like it's been done uh, over their backs, if that's an expression. Um, and now there's some changes that have been made, which seems to go in, in the right direction. But I think going forward, it seems to me that um, trying to involve these, these different uh, research disciplines in, in, uh, in, in drawing up these plans is going to be very important to get the buy-in from, from people all across the world, um, um, even maybe Germany, <laughs> um, which is going to be very important for this plan to, uh, to work. Um, and, um, and then this might also contribute to their field. Right, because it de depends on the field, what it, what it makes sense to to put open, for your mm -hmm. field to flourish and to, for the people to read it, which which um, uh, applies to open access publishing, but also to open access uh, data, which we'll be talking about later, I hope, a little bit as well. Um, so my question is, um, <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm coming up with a question: Will there be different APC costs allowed for the different disciplinary fields as well? Thank you for your attention. So an answer and a response, I think, there, perhaps, Stefan. Yes. Um, the short one is that I cannot answer your question. <laughs> um, uh, the, the documentation that was published two days ago with giving details about the implementation of planets on the point of the cap or of a, of a possible cap or, or the APC levels, when APCs applies, and maybe a first bracket there is that APCs is only one of many ways um, uh, uh, of being plan as compliant or of offering an open access solution. So plan is not APC specific. But on the issue of the cap, there will be a study commissioned to have a discussion and eventually take a decision on an evidence base. So I cannot give that to you today, the answer. Just a response to the comment. I actually agree with a lot that, was, that, that you said, um, so I don't have a, a, <laughs> a rebuttal, but I have a, a, a certain explanation. It was important for the funders to begin a conversation uh, based on principles uh, and not just completely open. So that's why the principles did come about uh, within funder discussions, um, but although even there already uh, these had been informed by discussions with, communi uh, with communities, a lot of the funders involved are actually run by communities. Uh, um, uh, they are run by scientific councils who are made up by active scientists who did bring in the views of, of their communities to that first discussion, but granted that first discussion was a funder internal discussion. But then, uh, when we published the principles in September, there has been a very lively debate, not structured, but lively on social media. We've received so many uh, input. Um, an explanation I can offer is that you said when the plan came about, the plan is coming about. So the current, this consultation that, I'm, uh, that I announced today and the debate here, this is still part of the coming about of the plan. The principles are fixed, the guidance for the implementation, so the, how the funders intend to implement it is now public, but uh, as you can see there is possibility to, to, to feedback and to involve the communities. Uh, so we are still in the process, it's not too late or it, it's, I mean, it's ongoing, but uh, I, would, I would agree with you that it is absolutely important to, to involve the scientists and to avoid a narrative that was there a little bit before we published the details, that Plan S is in some way uh, against scientists or, or, or forcing scientists. Plan S doesn't want to force scientists. Plan S wants to force publishers to move. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we have to be very clear. That's the target. Uh, and when we talk about uh, monitoring and sanctions, 
not the researchers should be afraid or should be uh, nervous at this time. Thank you. Yes, please. May we have a microphone middle to the lady? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Sylvia, I'm representing Yerun, the Young European Research University Network. I wanted to ask a question also to Stefan, I'm sorry. <laughs> but following a bit something that the president of the University of Zurich has mentioned very well, and is we need um, for, for this to be a real shift on open access, to be able for us to have this change, it has to be embraced globally. So we know, uh, and I've noted very positively already in your slide, uh, Stefan, but we have been seeing how many other funders have started to join or support it in their ways, uh, Plan S, and join in the future. But are there any specific plans to engage more countries, to engage internationally? We know also there have been some visits to that, but uh, is there a plan or roadmap there? Please, thank you. Y yes, there is. Um, you're, you're, you're totally right. And there are, by the way, there are members of Coalition S on the podium and in the audience, so if someone wants to add anything to my answers, please feel free. But yes, there is. Um, uh, there, uh, as you mentioned uh, visits. Um, those are the sort of visible tip of the iceberg of a lot of discussions that are going on with funders outside of Europe because it's absolutely crucial that this is a global plan and a global effort. One non-European funder joined, a very big one, the Gates Foundation uh, recently, um, and that is very much the plan and uh, an essential part of the plan is to grow it globally. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions, please? Yes, lady at the back, please. Hello, my name is Susanna Serdi. I'm from the Vision and Values. We are the EU liaison for the Geant Network and the administrator for the group of European Data Experts uh, Coordination Group of the Research Data Alliance. My question concerns the public sector information recast, which is going on vote to next week in the European Parliament and includes an amendment to oblige researchers to publish their research data if it's publicly funded, or even if partially publicly funded, and I would be interested in your opinions. Michael, please. You know, from the principle, I think it's a good idea. I think how it's implemented will be the big challenge. Uh, we have the big risk that we are working so hard getting publications publicly available that we forget that we'll have possibly exactly the same situation in the future with data, that some private aggregators will aggregate, will add added value service, and we'll have a quasi-monopoly on those data, and we'll be stuck having to buy our own data back from them because it's the only way to get the whole set of data. And so I think we have to be extremely careful. Uh, the other thing that we can uh, see is that you know, if, if you start getting vertical integration between the publishers and the data, uh, you know, it might be a great service. You can imagine, I'm a biologist, if I had an electronic lab notebook system that gets all the data, once I'm done with the experiments, it whips together the paper, directly linked to the data, and then it just slams the whole thing open access with the data in the repository and the paper in, in, the, in the publishing fields, and the links are made, uh, would be great but now I'm stuck having to use that service, right? And if that's a, if that's a for profit and it gets a quasi monopoly situation, I'll be paying through the nose, right? And we'll have what we had with Microsoft uh, in, in the 80s. Um, so we have to be extremely careful that we're not too focused on one aspect and that we forget that we might just do exactly the same error that we did before uh, in the coming decade. But I think as well, it's a great opportunity right now, learning from what has actually happened previously with the publications and going an exactly different route, very consciously, uh, by not doing the same mistake with the data. And I think there are great initiatives out there right now. Straight from the beginning, it can be mandated that this data needs to be open access, that it has to be freely available to anybody in the world. And I think you know, like that's a big learning curve already, and, and I see it as a somewhat smaller danger. I hope at least that we have learned something, you know, like from the previous system. Can I nuance that? I mean, I of course agree with Camilla and and, and Michael on the on the principle. Um, Doing it via a regulation like PSI, so public uh, sector information, um, and, f and forcing it um, is, is, is too blunt and, and, uh, as a measure. I actually like the approach that the Commission has for Horizon 2020 and, and Horizon Europe, presumably, of um, having an opt-out. So there, there may be, in some occasions, legitimate reasons to not open all the data 
all the time uh, research data. I, the default should be, of course, open, but there are there, 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 um, there, there may be ethical reasons and other reasons, and therefore doing it in a bulk legislation that addresses basically all type of public sector data, so, uh, 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 you know, a, a ministry's uh, phone records, uh, and, and then all the way down to research data. I think research data, and I'm not just saying this because I think it, it's special for some mystical reason, but research data in some cases does need to be closed um, when legitimate, and there should be an opt-out <coughs> for that. So I don't think legislation is the right way to allow that opt-out. Thank you. Probably got time for one more question. Yes, please, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, Gareth O'Neill, European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers, Eurodoc. Um, the majority of open access venues are diamond or platinum models, so authors and readers do not pay. There's a, another business model around that. Now, the, the discussion around Plan S has to a large extent focused on gold, APC open access, so paying to publish. Now, the question I have, um, and it's not directly to uh, Stefan, but to the panel, is what, how, how do you see the role of diamond platinum models or even fair open access models where there is perhaps an APC, but it's usually between 400 to 1,000 uh, euros per article? So what is the role of this model, and what is the role of this model in Plan S? Who would like to go first? <laughs> So Camilla and I have different opinions there. Um, I feel long term, actually, we should mostly have platinum publishing. I find it weird that you know the public basically has. We have a public system for generating the data, generating the knowledge. We put a lot of money to that, and then the last mile, the last one percent of the activity, somehow we simply outsource it into for-profit companies. They do a reasonable job, and of course, for profit is okay. Basically, we buy our reagents from for-profit companies, we buy our, our machines from for-profit company. It works again, and I think the major challenge, and Kimla might be right, if there's transparency and competition, it might work. <coughs> but I think basically, I, if I were a big funding agency, I would simply do it this way, right? You you find you fund 99% of the stuff. Now you're going to fund 100% anyway. Why don't we have a system where the scientists are in charge? of the last step also. But that's not going to happen in four years. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen in three years. And that's why I think the focus on gold is extremely pragmatic. It's the way forward quickly. And then if scientists really want to be own, own back the, the public shame process, well, then go and do it yourself, right? I mean, you know how, you know how to work. It works. You, you are the editors. You are the reviewers. You know how to do it. All you need is platforms and, and build it up. May I ask Camilla to respond, seeing as uh, Michael, and then Falcon, I'll come <coughs> to you, of course. Yes. Well, I mean, from my perspective, you know, like, first of all, I believe that in Frontiers, the scientists are in charge, maybe not of the operations, of the business model or whatever, but of the editing and accept, reject the entire editorial process. I mean, like, we, we started Frontiers with this idea that we will empower community, that we as researchers, we we're back then at the EPFL, will take publishing back into our own hands. Um, we did try it, and, and you know, I told the story the last time at the, at the forum. You know, like we did try to go in a route where somebody would fund this operation, and it would be all free, free to publish, free to read, uh, etc. It didn't work out. Uh, maybe we weren't good enough at fundraising or convincing people to put money into the it. The time or, wasn't right, I think. Or maybe the time wasn't right. But so we had, to, we had to convert it into a model where we did find investments and because we wanted to make science open. That was the mission. And we wanted scientists to be in the driving seat. So I think, you know, like, there is still today, this evilizing of the for-profit model, I think, is, is wrong, uh, in, in, in my opinion, completely. Because actually what we did manage is to drive the costs down, and we did manage to empower scientists, and we did manage to have a very rigorous uh, review and certification process, and you can see the quality in the numbers. I mean, it's undisputable. It works. Um, I have nothing against the plan, and, and I would applaud it. You know, like we wanted to do it uh, in the same way, and if somebody finds a mechanisms, uh, mechanism of how to do it, I'll be the first one to copy it. Uh, you know, that's how it's going to be. But what I do think, you know, like in the entire thing, what is incredibly important that there is transparency and openness. And what I do not like about the platinum model is that it says it's for free. It's not for free, people. 
you know, somebody is paying, whether it's a funder or whether it's a university or, or a foundation or some, you know, like great angel or fairy godmother, somebody is paying that there are people that are reviewing the articles, that are publishing the articles, that are building a platform and so forth. So what I would wish for, if it is platinum and it's fine, uh, as I said, I will copy it and I will adopt the model if it works, uh, but to make the cost of this transparent as well, so that we can, we can all compare and we can see what's the best value for the best service, right? Fair enough. May I? Folk Festival, and then yeah. Alexis, I'll... Um, first of all, one, one correction. So you are right by saying uh, most of the open access journals don't ask for APCs. But the correction is most of the articles published open access ask for APCs. And the reason is because that also depicts journals like, uh, mega journals like uh, PLOS One and, and, and scientific reports. Um, the second one... Uh, you are right, and we're doing a lot of things, some funders at least, uh, um, supporting models like the Open Library of Humanities or SciPost, etc. And I think also Plan S stated that explicitly that we will do it together in the future. And But the, the biggest problem with new publication models is always the same, this branding. Yeah how to convince uh, established researchers or younger researchers who want to make a career uh, to publish in a new uh, platform. And therefore, we should also keep in mind another approach that I mentioned it before, convince learned societies to flip their journals. And I give you a really short example. Uh, I think EMBO is known, the uh, European Molecular Bi Biology, that is really close to EMBL, the uh, European Molecular Biology Laboratories. And they are funded by membership fees from 28 countries. And if you look in, in, in the membership fees, then it would only need a slight increase of every membership in, uh, fee to uh, switch all the renowned EMBO journals to open access journals comparing to all the other expenses that they have, the personnel and, and machines and so on. That could be an approach. Um, that is, could be also true for other uh, respective international uh, organizations like the CERN or the European University Institute in Florence for the Social Sciences and, and, and Humanities. Because, the, to be frank, the, uh, comparing to the entire research budget, the publication budget is only is uh, a very, very uh, slight share of that, a minor share of that. Alexis. Yeah, I would like to uh, quickly react to something you said. You know, basically, uh, it looked a little bit too easy. I would somehow, uh, you know, agree with Camilla. Uh, it's not that easy to launch a, a, a review. Uh, I think, obviously, you can publish whatever you want on the web. I mean, you know, the web is out there. Uh, even someone like me could be able to publish something on the web. Uh, that, that, should, that should tell you. Uh, but the point is that uh, certification and convincing, you know, people who have hard, hard, uh, worked hard, hard, hard uh, on their uh, publications uh, to uh, put uh, their uh, uh, work for certification uh, in a given review, that is much harder. And I think that, you know, coming back to this platform, uh, two-sided markets, you need to convince the people uh, who have been working hard uh, to submit your, their research uh, were uh, uh, in a given journal. And I think that, you know, these things have not worked badly until now, uh, also with publishers uh, like Elsevier and the others. And so it's really important uh, to understand that uh, these things uh, work quite well, and we uh, in Europe, you know, we uh, uh, are lagging in terms of, you know, our research is not as well published as uh, in uh, other parts of the world, uh, namely the US, for instance. And I think that it is important that we do not uh, uh, shoot in our own feet uh, by basically, you know, uh, wanting to invent something new that will be just as good, etc., and forgetting about how uh, the benefits of the uh, of uh, the the current system, and that's mainly in terms of.
terms of certification. And in terms, indeed, that, uh, you know, researchers are not uh, uh, served that badly by the current system. And we need to, if, if we want to go to another system, it should be at least as good uh, in terms of uh, achieving, you know, the certification and whatever. And um, what I have heard also from the room is that uh, it's, again, important to have researchers on board and not only, you know, the second tier of researchers, but also the guys who, in Europe, do the best research. And I think that, you know, we should uh, keep the highest quality research in Europe. And that's mainly uh, one of the main important points for me. So it's not that certification is here, it's broke, it's simply overpriced. And it's absolutely possible to get new certifications on board. Camilla is there and has proved it. They're one of the biggest publishers they started 10 years ago. People trust Frontiers, right? People trust eLife. eLife, that's one of the platinum models where, where funders basically do it. And you need to have confidence. And the way you do it is by making sure that the editors and the viewers are the top scientists and that they put their money where, where their mouse is, and that they, these top scientists also publish there and say, look, I trust this new journal. I trust this new publisher. Of course, you know, we're talking about something that will not happen in two years. It's going to be in 10 years, 20 years. Reputation takes time, absolutely. But again, if we don't start today, well, well we won't yeah. get there tomorrow either. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, any last words from you? You didn't speak on this topic. Very happy to skip this one. <laughs> <laughs> He's had enough already. I'm afraid I'm going to have to close it right now. We are, we are just about out of time for this session. So um, I hope you'll join me in thanking our panel for this session. Please. Put your hand. And uh, I invite you to take some refreshment across the way. Uh, our team will show you the way. And, uh, and we reconvene back in uh, at five past in fif 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>